Thank you to the Coptic Medical Society for inviting me to speak today. So I'm going to be talking about COVID-19, obviously, immune protection for the second wave. So um, I'm aware that I'm speaking to a lot of eminent doctors, but there may also be some people who are listening who are not doctors, are lay people. So I've tried to balance my talk to um, not be too scientific for the lay people, but also not to talk down too much to doctors. So I hope I've achieved the right balance. Apologies if I haven't. So I've got a huge amount of information here. I can't lecture it all today. So what I'm doing is I'm making my slides available on the Coptic Medical Society website. So you can download those, they're in PDF form, and you can use those to check my information and look up my references and anything else you want to do. So there'll be some slides I'll just be skipping over. Um, and on the subject of references, you doctors will be used to seeing the scientific references as researcher names, journal, date and volume number. That isn't always the case now with COVID-19. Because very sensibly, um, they, have, they have decided that because the peer review process takes so long, that these papers that are coming out now thick and fast should be made available to everybody immediately. So they are all on various preprint websites, as I'm sure you know, um, which are open access, so anybody can, can look at them and learn from them. So they will be peer-reviewed eventually, but they just haven't been yet. So that's why my references are going to be a mixture of standard references and preprint websites. Okay. As the uh, Director General of the World Health Organization so rightly says, we're not just fighting an epidemic, we're fighting an infodemic. And it's a time for facts, not fear. And that's why I've called my talk an evidence-based guide. Because everything that I say is backed up by science. Science doesn't always agree, this is true, but there is always science to back up what I say. If I'm venturing my own opinion, which I will from time to time, then I will flag it up as my opinion, so you'll know. So let's look at the recent respiratory viruses, the pandemics of the recent years. So in the 20th century, we had three big ones, the, the worst probably being the 1918 Spanish flu virus, which killed more people than the First World War. But then we moved to the first 20 years of the 21st century, and we've had four of them, and we're in the middle of the fourth right now. So this is not a good trend. Um, and we're almost certainly going to see an increasing number of these viral pandemics in the future. Others have picked up the fact that there is roughly 650% annual increase in the number of epidemics in the last 20 years compared to the 200 years before that. And the World Economic Forum has also noticed this, predicting that epidemics will become more common as we're all traveling more and goods are traveling and we're increasingly connected. The World Health Organization reports there are 7,000 signals of potential viral outbreaks every month. So that's not a good sign. And these come from Southeast Asia, South America and West Africa in the main. But these are huge areas and it's impossible to monitor them to the extent that viral outbreaks can be suppressed. So um, wait for more pandemics to arrive. And in fact, while we were still trying to uh, get over COVID-19, we had uh, on the news in, at the end of June, respiratory virus with human pandemic potential found in pigs in China. This is another version of swine flu, which is likely to jump to humans. And not seven days later, bubonic plague in China again. This is something we thought we'd eradicated in the Middle Ages. So these viruses are still around and being reactivated, which is quite a scary thought. And we're going to have to live with COVID-19 and these other viruses for a very long time to come. And I think most scientists are aware of this now. Um, and certainly the SAGE group, which advises our government, has said that COVID-19 will be present forever 
in some form or another, and it would not be a disease like smallpox, which can be eradicated by vaccination. So vaccination has its limitations here, a point I'm going to come back to in a minute. And uh, indeed, scientists have consistently said that it's impossible to completely eradicate COVID-19. And we're still living with two of the respiratory viruses from earlier this century. And it was only in 2018 that there was an outbreak of a swine flu in this country. So this is still around as well. And they're just counted now as seasonal flu. And that's almost certainly what's going to be happening with COVID-19 as well. And in fact, if any of you saw uh, Sir David Attenborough's wonderful TV documentary, Extinction, The Facts, there was a prominent UK scientist who warned that there could be five new emerging diseases every year in the future. Five. So it's not looking good. So we have to deal with COVID, but we also have to be looking forward to whatever else is on the way. So COVID-19 is also known as SARS-CoV-2. This is to distinguish it from the original SARS back in 2003, which is now sometimes known as SARS-CoV-1. And it's a type of coronavirus, and we've all got used to seeing this picture of it from the news. And of course, it's called a coronavirus because of the, the, the appearance of the spikes on the surface of the virus itself. Uh, there are many other types of coronavirus. MERS and SARS were both coronaviruses, and uh, roughly a third of all cases of the common cold are caused by coronaviruses. Principal medical risk factors, I think, are reasonably well known to all of us. Age is a big one. It's also worth pointing out that many of these conditions are inflammatory, um, which of course is also more prevalent with age. Other COVID-19 risk factors, I'm not going to run through them all, but it's worth mentioning um, the Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic or BAME community, which has been in the news quite a lot recently because this community suffers disproportionately from um, not only catching COVID-19, but also suffering very severe COVID-19 and dying from it. And I'll be saying quite a lot about this later. Um, in the body, uh, severe COVID-19 is a multi-system inflammatory disease. There's no question about that. And um, death can occur from acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, sepsis, and the cytokine storm, which is excessive and uncontrolled inflammation. So I said this was about immune protection. So let's have a look at our immune system. So um, this has evolved some really, truly astonishing mechanisms for protecting ourselves against all pathogens. And by pathogen, I mean viruses, bacteria, parasites, anything that is going to harm the body. But it's dealt with all of these so successfully over the years that we are still here as the human race. We are not extinct. If the viruses had won, we would be extinct by now and we'd be joining our friends, the dinosaurs. But we're still here. There have been deaths along the way, sometimes a lot of deaths. But our immune system has coped with everything and can do so again. So I'm going to just quickly run through uh, what the immune system comprises, which probably this is not necessary for you doctors, but uh, for some people it might be. So there are two parts to the immune system. The innate immune system, this carries out immune surveillance for pathogens, and whenever it detects a pathogen, it sends out various uh, molecules and macrophages and inflammatory cytokines and natural killer cells to deal with it, to destroy the viruses or whatever else. I realize natural killer cells makes this sound like a video game, but I think natural killer cells got their name before the video game did. Uh, cytokines, if you haven't come across these before, are um, signaling molecules, and in this case, they are encouraging inflammation, which is a good thing in the initial stages of getting rid of the virus. So then we have the adaptive immune system. Now, how this works is that uh, once the innate immune system has been activated by a pathogen, um, it immediately forms an immunological memory for the adaptive immune system, 
and this comes in the form of antibodies and um, T cells and natural killer cells which remember the pathogen and any time they see it again or a related pathogen, so another type of coronavirus, for example, they will spring into action to destroy the virus. And this, in fact, is a faster mechanism of the, than the innate immune system, which takes, uh, relatively speaking, a rather long time to detect the virus and then to destroy it. So the um, adaptive immune system is hugely helpful to us. Um, and uh, in fact, this is the basis of vaccination. Vaccination will let a small amount of the virus into the body, not enough, hopefully, to do any damage, but enough to activate the, immune, the innate immune system so that immunological memory is formed. And therefore, if it comes along again, the body will say, OK, I do know about this one. I'm going to go and kill it. So that's how that works. And then we've probably all heard on the news about herd immunity. And I know that several people are very confused about what actually this means. So I thought I'd just run through this as well. This occurs when a sufficiently large proportion of the population has become immune to the virus, that the transmission rate from person to person is close to zero. And this means that the whole community is protected, not just those who have immunity. And I found this, this wonderful little cartoon, which describes it actually very well. So this should perhaps be flock immunity because these are sheep, not cattle, but never mind. So the gray sheep all have natural immunity to the virus. The white sheep do not. And you can see the virus is bouncing off the gray sheep and not attacking, not attacking the white sheep. So that is how herd immunity works. But in fact, it's a very inexact science. We think it works like this, but there are a lot of uncertainties. And then there is the herd immunity threshold, and this is the proportion of the population that's capable of getting the disease to spread it. And this is all down to the R number, or replication number, something we've all heard a lot about on the news recently, as the R number is rising in this country. So the R number basically is, if I get the disease, and I pass it on to just one person, that is R1. If I get the disease and pass it on to two people, then that is R2. So what we're looking for is an R number of less than one, because that means that the virus is declining. So how can we actually achieve herd immunity? Because that is surely what we're all after. Well, there's two means, vaccination and infection. But as I said, it's not an exact science, so lots of uncertainties. So vaccines have been hugely successful in controlling a lot of really nasty diseases like polio and smallpox. Um, but as the SAGE committee has uh, warned, it may not do the same for COVID-19. Uh, you can also get herd immunity from infection. And I've just run through how sufficient people get um, antibodies and T cell immunity against a future infection. And that will do just as well. So how can we protect ourselves? Because this is what my talk is really about. So Boris Johnson put us all into lockdown in March. And he said, we are shining the light of science on this invisible killer which sounded promising. But then we got lockdown. We got self-isolation, quarantine, social distancing, masks, hand washing, all the things we know so well. And waiting for a safe and effective vaccine. Governments, and not just ours, all of them, with the possible exception of Sweden, have no other strategy but this. This is all that they have come up with to, for us to do and it's not actually working terribly well right now. So what about waiting for a vaccine? Wouldn't that actually be the best and simplest idea? Well, it's a lovely thought, but we don't yet have a vaccine that's safe and effective. When we had the three pandemics earlier in this century, scientists tried very hard to come up with a vaccine for MERS, for SARS, for swine flu, but they failed, all the clinical trials failed, Either the vaccine wasn't safe 
or it wasn't effective. We never achieved one, or I'm sure we would be using it now, but no. But even if one was found to be safe and effective, we're going to have huge supply problems. So remember all the problems we had getting enough test kits, getting enough protective equipment for the NHS workers. So people seem to have the idea that we are going to wake up at some magical date in early 2021 and we're all suddenly going to be vaccinated. Well, no, we're not. Vaccines are going to be in quite short supply for some time to come. And quite rightly, the government wants to vaccinate the vulnerable first. Absolutely. And then they should vaccinate the NHS workers. People like me, who doesn't come into either of those categories, is going to be at the bottom of the pile. Quite rightly. But the fact is, we're not going to be vaccinated in a hurry. So there is little point in relying on vaccines in the, in the short to medium term. And an expert group from the Royal Society has picked up on this and warned that even if we do get a vaccine, which is safe and effective, life will not return to normal and we need to be realistic about this. Added to which, Anthony Fauci, who uh, advises the White House, who has said exactly the same thing, and he is a big proponent of vaccination. He thinks this, this is a, a good thing to do, but even he has said we shouldn't rely on it. It's not the only thing that we should be doing. Vaccines on their own are not enough because several reasons. Firstly, the elderly often don't have a good response to vaccination. We know that from the flu vaccine. Also, there are some other people, not in the elderly category, who also don't seem to respond to vaccines. We know this from the flu vaccine. Added to which, uh, immune protection can decrease with time. So that may mean we need boosters, in which case, more supply problems. Furthermore, it is in the nature of viruses that they mutate. This means that if COVID-19 mutates sufficiently, and we already know that it's mutated several times, if it mutates sufficiently, the original vaccine is not going to be protective. So that means a new vaccine. So I think you can see all the problems that vaccination comes with. It's not going to be the panacea that we are all hoping for. So the message here is we shouldn't put our hives on hold waiting for the vaccine. It won't return life to normal. We need to find something better to do. So this talk is about our immune system. So let's, talk, let's discuss that. We've already said our immune system exists to protect us from all infectious organisms, uh, for which it does an extremely good job. There is a huge amount of science showing that the immune system can be supported and boosted to protect against viral infections. But this is something that the government, scientists and Public Health England have completely failed to mention. They have never once mentioned that we have an immune system which is perfectly capable of protecting us from COVID-19, or at least protecting us from severe COVID-19, provided it is sufficiently healthy. No one has mentioned this, and is not just in this country. I haven't seen a single country around the world where the experts and the government have been mentioning the immune system. So I am going to shine the light of science on our immune system to try to redress the balance. So first of all, what can impair immune function? Well, there's a lot of things, and I'm sure you're all fully aware of all of this. Diet, which also feeds into uh, many of the COVID-19 risk factors. Lifestyle, poor sleep, chronic stress, intestinal dysbiosis is too many pathogenic bacteria in the gut and suboptimal intake of essential micronutrients. And anybody eating a typical Western diet is going to be deficient in essential micronutrients. So what can we do? Well, first of all, there is evidence that patients with severe COVID-19 have depleted numbers of natural killer cells and their function is exhausted. This is not good news for the patients, but there is a lot that we can do. Most of the elements on the previous slide are completely under our control. And even the elderly 
if they pay attention to all of that, can have a healthy and robust immune system, which can protect them, if not utterly from COVID-19, and certainly from the worst um, symptoms of COVID-19, and hopefully from death. I'm going to focus on the absolutely essential micronutrients, which are vitamin C and D and zinc, which is a mineral. And the European Food Safety Authority acknowledges that these are necessary for maintenance of functions of the immune system. So this is what you all need to know. How to protect ourselves from COVID-19 and what to do if we become infected. And I want to point out, first of all, that Whatever measures you, you take away from this, they need to be instituted today. It's no good waiting until you have COVID-19 symptoms because the symptoms often don't appear until day 10 after you've been infected. By day 10, the virus has already got a very strong foothold in the body. It's not impossible to get rid of it, but it's certainly more difficult, much easier to prevent it at the start. So please, please implement these measures now. Now I'm going to start with vitamin C and now you're going to have a, a lot of slides where I, which I'm not going to be lecturing because it's just the results of studies. But, uh, for, but you will see from this that there are a lot of studies on all, the, all these three essential micronutrients. So here is vitamin C. These all show that vitamin C enhances the immune system. Now, vitamin C and uh, COVID-related acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, vitamin C levels were undetectable in 90% of the patients with ARDS. This is not good news at all. And here's a US study, low vitamin C in COVID-19 was a risk factor for mortality. And in fact, there is some suggestion that, well, we know that all infections can deplete vitamin C, but certainly COVID-19 seems to do that to the extent that it induces scurvy, another disease which we thought we had eradicated several centuries ago. COVID-19 and scurvy have several common symptoms. It is interesting. I don't think anybody has greatly explored that, but they probably will. Here are a lot of studies showing that vitamin C is protective against any respiratory virus and pneumonia, common factor in uh, COVID-19. And here is intravenous vitamin C, which is being used, trialled certainly now very successfully for uh, hospital patients. And it, it's the problem with vit oral vitamin C is that it, there comes a point where you just can't absorb anymore. Intravenous vitamin C bypasses that, and um, it's now been, well, it's successfully used here to reduce sepsis and mortality, and it's very effective in a number of protocols um, in, in treating COVID-19 itself. So the best known of these is the Math Plus protocol, which I'm going to be running through a bit later. Um, this is the, the Math Plus protocol is a grouping of American doctors. Here's another uh, another grouping of American doctors using vitamin C intravenously. We're now trialling of intravenous vitamin C at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. They haven't published yet, but uh, allegedly the, the, the trial has gone extremely well. And it's also being included in the Remap CAP study, uh, which is an international multi-centre study, uh, which is the UK arm is at the Royal Surrey County Hospital. Also, uh, using intravenous vitamin C, not ready to report yet. Vitamin D now. So here's a load of studies showing that it's essential for an appropriate immune response. So many studies that I've had to run over into two slides. Now, I want to talk about vitamin D levels in the blood. So um, this obviously is serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And you will all be familiar with this chart, which shows the levels. So I hope you can see that, all right. So uh, under 30 nanomoles per litre is outright vitamin D deficiency. Between 30 and 50 is vitamin D insufficiency. And over 50 nanomoles per litre is deemed to be sufficient. Now, this is where we come on to my personal opinion. 
um, and those of several experts who consider that this is woefully inadequate as a level for vitamin D. It should be a bare minimum, 75 nanomoles per litre, preferably getting on for 100. And you will see that this is borne out in some of the studies that I'm going to show you in a minute. So here's an international study showing that the UK serum levels average 50 nanomoles per litre. Oh, well, that's all right then. No, it isn't. Because what that means is that 50% of the UK population is under this inadequate level of 50 nanomoles per litre. So even by those uh, conventional definitions, they have vitamin D insufficiency or outright deficiency. The Royal Society has picked up on this and said that since vitamin D is an important regulatory role in the immune system, the government really needs to be providing a stronger message. Absolutely. Because the 50 nanomoles per litre is a level that came about in order to prevent rickets. It's totally inadequate for the immune system and is not tested for the immune system. And as I said, experts believe a level of over 100 is more appropriate. And it's hardly surprising with 50% of the UK population below 50 nanomoles per litre that rickets has reappeared in this country. Another disease that should have been eradicated several centuries ago. And there's the references. Right, so let's translate blood level into recommended daily allowance or RDA. So, current UK guidelines are to supplement 400 international units a day. Vitamin D is not measured in, in milligrams, it's international units. So. so, this is in order to achieve a level or a serum level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D of 50 nanomoles per litre. Europe and the US, however, recommend 600 per day, with 800. For the, for the elderly to achieve the same level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. How come? This does not compute. And why does the UK not recommend a high level for the elderly? Because really it should. Furthermore, why does the UK not recommend a higher level from the, for the BAME community? Because it's well known that they have significant vitamin D deficiency. Nothing has been done to publicize this or to correct it. And also, there's a, there's a persuasive argument that the US and a European recommendations of 600 international units a day was derived at through a statistical error. Now, I'm rubbish at statistics, so I'm not going to go through this, but better brains than mine have said that this is, uh, this is the case. So it should be considerably higher. And the financial cost of the UK's vitamin D deficiency alone prior to COVID-19 has been estimated at around 20 billion a year. That is shocking. Wasted money. So, studies showing that there is indeed vitamin D deficiency in COVID-19. Again, this runs on to two slides. So, I'm just going to highlight the first one. The UK is among those countries with the greatest mean vitamin D deficiency in COVID-19 patients. Uh, vitamin D status is strongly inversely associated with COVID-19 incidence, hospitalization, prevalence in intensive care, and mortality. And these COVID-19 studies are all obviously cross-sectional, but there is a prospective study here, people who where blood was taken the year before, um, and it shows exactly the same thing. So here's the second slide. So I found 14 studies in total, 13 of which all showed that low vitamin D levels were associated with COVID-19 problems. So it's the nature of science that you will never get all studies showing the same result. It just doesn't happen. But I think that 13 out of 14 is a pretty good, pretty good record. Poor vitamin D status is also related to many of the COVID-19 risk factors. And many experts are now coming around to thinking that boosting vitamin D levels is the obvious place to start. 
if we are to protect against COVID-19 and its worst excesses. Now let's look at COVID-19 mortality. So it's the red line that you need to be looking at here. This is the death rate. Uh, the scale on the bottom shows the vitamin D blood concentration, and this is in American units, um, which is nanograms per milliliter, but it's easy enough to convert them, and I've done it for you anyway. This is an Indonesian study, but there's no reason to suppose that it's not any different uh, in any other country. But what you can see here is that the death rate starts to turn down at a level of 27.5 uh, nanograms per milliliter, this is approximately 70 nanomoles per liter. Not 50, 70. But up there, it, the death rate is still unacceptable. It gets down to zero at 35 nanograms per milliliter. This is 85 nanomoles per liter. Not 50, 85. And that's just to reduce deaths. Now let's look at the BAME community and vitamin D levels. Um, it's, it's well known that they are much lower and it's due to the melanin pigment in the skin. Uh, we don't have sufficient sun in our northern climate here to, to give this community the vitamin D that they need. Public Health England, however, says 400 IUs per day. But as we said before, this is to avoid rickets it's got nothing to do with the immune system or COVID-19. But even if the individuals in the BAME community took 400 IUs per day, they still would not achieve the blood level to avoid rickets. In other words, 50 nanomoles per litre. And now UK scientists are having money thrown at them to discover why the BAME community is suffering so much from COVID-19. But I think at least part of the answer is right here. It's simple. Studies of vitamin D deficiency in the BAME community. So here we are, uh, being a member of the BAME community was a significant independent predictor of vitamin D deficiency with an odds ratio of 8.86. So what that means is that the BAME community are almost nine times more likely to have vitamin D deficiency than somebody who is not part of that community. So, relating back to now other, other studies looking at vitamin D deficiency in severe COVID-19 and what it means for the uh, 25 uh, hydroxy vitamin D levels. So there's the chart again. Here's a joint US-Egyptian study. Mean serum vitamin D levels among COVID-19 patients 22.9 nanomoles per litre. Not 50, and well under 30. So 22.9, so very severe deficiency there. And more studies showing exactly the same result. I won't run through them all. So vitamin D can now be part of a protocol for treatment, as well as prevention. And there are numerous trials which include it as part of a protocol. And again, I'll look at the protocols a bit later. But then we had the first randomized control trial of vitamin D versus no vitamin D, which persuaded Matt Hancock to think again about vitamin D. I'm sure you saw the, um, this on the news. So this study is from Spain, um, and it's a very interesting one. So basically, their COVID-19 patients were given normal standard care this was hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. So everybody got that. Then the patients were randomized to vitamin D or placebo. But it was in fact highly successful. 2% of the patients given vitamin D were transferred to intensive care. 50% of those who did not get vitamin D. None of those having vitamin D died 8% of those without vitamin D died. So that's fairly conclusive. So Matt Hancock's now ordered a review into the use of vitamin D. No doubt this will take a long time to come. But anyway, we've got to start somewhere. 
So vitamin D dosage to achieve what, what I consider to be an adequate serum level. So let's look at trying to get to 75 nanomoles per litre, because that is going to keep you pretty safe. So an adult will need to take 4,000 IUs per day for three months if they are already in insufficiency or deficiency to get to 75 nanomoles per litre. So if you're starting now from a position of deficiency, you need to be taking a lot more for a couple of weeks. But GPs now, I believe, will test vitamin D if you ask. So um, they should be able to tell you how you're doing. So the BAME community may need twice as much as this. They may need 8,000 IUs per day, quite likely. Probably the elderly too. Now, in case you've heard of vitamin D toxicity from excess intake, I just want to put your minds at rest. The issue came about because the UK Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition, SACN, reported in 2016 that um, they were setting a recommended upper level of intake of 2,000 IUs per day. And this was due to a study which had come out in 2006, showing that there could be a toxic effect. Well, yes, that's absolutely true. However, it didn't say what they claimed it said. What it actually said was that toxicity can occur at concentrations beyond 500 nanomoles per litre. I'm suggesting 100. It's a far cry from 500. So the warning has been misunderstood and misquoted, and people have restricted their vitamin D intake needlessly and possibly dangerously as a result of it. To get to a blood level of 500 nanomoles per litre, you would actually need to take more than 30,000 IUs per day for three months. Nobody is going to do that. So, in fact, in the short term, doses of 30,000 IUs per day have been demonstrated to be perfectly safe by the European Food Safety Authority. Sometimes you need magnesium to activate vitamin D. If you're getting all your vitamin D from the sun, that's fine. But very few of us are now, um, and not likely to for the next year or so. So therefore, magnesium can be needed. Um, this is because um, otherwise the vitamin D doesn't make the final conversion to the active form. Now, if you're already eating a huge amount of green vegetables, particularly green leafy vegetables, you're probably already getting sufficient magnesium. But if you're not somebody who likes your vegetables, then I recommend taking 400 milligrams a day. And uh, yes, here are studies showing um, the effectiveness of magnesium for COVID-19 prevention and treatment. Again, part of a protocol. Zinc. Uh, zinc is necessary for a healthy immune response. And zinc deficiency um, is very common in the elderly. And one of the signs of zinc deficiency is loss of taste and smell. One of the signs of COVID-19 is loss of taste and smell. Coincidence? No, I don't think so. So uh, zinc is highly successful for both prevention and treatment. And um, one of the reasons that I think hydroxychloroquine is used and is used successfully in a lot of the studies for COVID-19 is that it is in fact a zinc ionophore. What that means is that it helps to transport the zinc into the cells where it can be used, because zinc can be a bit sluggish about that. So I haven't in fact seen that there is any other mechanism of action involved in hydroxychloroquine other than being a zinc ionophore. But if you can't get your hands on any uh, hydroxychloroquine, there is a perfectly good alternative, and that is quercetin. Um, which is a very good zinc ionophore in its own right and also has many useful antiviral properties. Quercetin is available in all health food shops and on the internet. And here are studies showing that it's good for COVID-19 and other viruses. So I said I was going to look at the protocols, so I'm just going to have a quick look at two of the best ones. Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance, this is the American grouping. Uh, this is led by Dr. Paul Marek and they have produced some very successful trials and a very, very good protocol. And you can, you can download it. They've made it available on this website. 
Uh, it looks like that. And they have a zero death rate in all patients who do not have end-stage comorbidities. That's pretty impressive. And this is um, right. the principles underlying the Math Plus protocol is really recognition that the infection of COVID-19 appears in two phases. The first phase is viral replication. In this case, you need antivirals. What you absolutely do not need is anti-inflammatories because what you're trying to do is kill the virus and inflammation is actually quite helpful there. Then oxygen saturation starts to decline. This means you've gone into the inflammatory phase of COVID-19. So now you need your anti-inflammatories. And they have shown this quite nicely with the diagram, viral replication in blue and um, excessive inflammation in orange. Obviously there's no strict cutoff, there is overlap, but that shows it quite nicely. So here is the Math Plus protocol, and you'll see they've got intravenous vitamin C, zinc, vitamin D, and intravenous magnesium. Excellent. And they've helpfully given us an at-home protocol as well. Vitamin C, zinc, quercetin, and vitamin D3. They've also got melatonin in there, because in the United States, melatonin is available over the counter. So um, that's all very helpful. But you do have to be careful of oxygen saturation. So if it drops below 94%, you do need to seek medical advice. Swiss policy research is also another highly successful protocol. So prevention, zinc, quercetin, brom bromhexine stops mucus building up, vitamin C, vitamin D, the same but greater doses for early treatment. And the hospital treatment includes very high dose vitamin D. All excellent. And President Trump, um, his doctors are being a bit cagey about what exactly he was given, but um, reportedly he, the protocol included vitamin D and zinc. And if you work in a NHS hospital, you might have come across frontline immune support for NHS staff. This is a grouping who crowdfunded to supply NHS frontline staff with free uh, essential micronutrients including vitamin C, vitamin D, and obviously zinc. They use liposomal vitamin C, which is uh, one that is more easily absorbed than um, the water-based variety. So if you've come across this grouping, that's hugely, they did a hugely wonderful job, um, but they shouldn't have had to do it. This was crowdfunded, this was a citizen's initiative, which was crowdfunded. It should have been given by the government. So, you'll be pleased to note that I've arrived at my conclusion. We may never develop herd immunity or have a safe and effective vaccine, at least for some time. Take a long time to vaccinate everyone and it won't work for everyone. With the prospect of further lockdown, we have to find a better way to protect ourselves. We'll have to live with COVID-19 indefinitely, and not just COVID-19, but also all the future viruses which are on their way to us. Science, medicine and governments throughout the world have completely ignored the immune system, which is highly effective at pre preventing viruses to take hold in the body. And immune function impaired by 21st century lifestyles and particularly the lack of vitamin C, vitamin D and zinc. So the BAME community, particularly at risk, and this, in fact, was something that I highlighted in the submission that I made to the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee. Um, I recommended that official guidance on personal immune su system support is provided to the whole of the UK population, um, comprising adequate supplementation, vitamins C, D and zinc, and that protect, to protect those at risk, including the BAME community and all healthcare workers, these key supplements should be provided free of charge. I don't know if anything has come of this yet. We're still waiting. The micronutrients are incredibly cheap, not for us perhaps who's buying them so much, but for government. When you compare that with the cost of hospitalization of a COVID-19 patient, with the cost of transferring them to, to ICU, and you can't put a price on the value of a life saved. 
So I'm just going to show you a summary of the micronutrients that I suggest and the, the dosages. So I'll leave that up and finish there. Thank you very much.